All right, back on the other church. All right, more good news and bad news. Uh, good news, New York Attorney General uh, Cuomo is going after eight banks that, quote-unquote, dupe the rating agencies. Now, that's uh, similar to what we were talking about uh, with the Franken Amendment. Uh, he's going to uh, amend the way the rating agencies work. Now, first, I was a little skeptical about this because the rating agencies, they didn't really get duped. They knew what they were doing. They knew they were playing ball to get all that money. Uh, you see, what the bankers would do is they'd go to uh, Standard & Poor's and, and, and Moody's, for example, and go, now, I can give you a multi-million dollar co uh, contract to rate my um, CDO that I put together, or I can give it to Moody's. Which one would you prefer? And Standard & Poor's goes, oh, I think that's rated AAA. And Moody's goes, oh, I think it's even rated even better. <laughs> okay? To give me the multi-million dollar contract. It's the wrong incentives. And they know what they're doing, right? But, you know, as I read more into the story, I think Cuomo has a good point. Uh, Goldman uh, would call this ratings arbitrage, where they would see the models that the, these companies had online, and they would try to game the models on purpose and misleading, mislead the rating agencies in the way that they packaged what they called the CDOs, uh, which is uh, just a bunch of mortgages put together in a dangerous way, basically. Collateralized debt obligations is what they called it. And then uh, ratings arbitrage means that they think that there's money to be made uh, by a hole in the market, an inefficiency in the market. And the inefficiency in the market is how stupid the rating agencies are and how they could easily be tricked. So now, was that trick legal or illegal? That's what they're going to have to decide in New York. But I love that at least someone's looking into that. So um, it looks like we've got a short-term uh, attack on this from the New York Attorney General. And we've got a long-term fix uh, from Al Franken and the amendment passed today. So, you know, it's hard to get better news than that. Now, when we get to the bad news, uh, Paul Abrams has figured out, along with a lot of other people, uh, oh, my God, uh, yeah, these banks right now can borrow near 0% interest uh, from the Fed and then turn around, forget any other thing they're supposed to do. Remember, we're giving them all this money so they lend it out to people, to small businesses. That's a joke. They're not letting it out to anybody. No, they t instantly took in hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that we, I'm sorry, hundreds of billions of dollars that we gave them. This is another story that, that points it out. And uh, TARP uh, uh, watchdog uh, Elizabeth Warren wrote about this in a report that just got released. They took in all the money, and instead of lending it out uh, like we were supposed to get to get the economy going, they just kept it in their own vaults so that they could have more money to gamble with, so they could have bigger leverage. Okay, I mean, w Tim Geithner, if he didn't realize that was the game that was being played on him, is such a fool. You know how I was talking about, hey, um, it's not that whether we did the bailout or we didn't do the bailout, it's how did we do the bailout. And Tim Geithner gave them hundreds of billions of dollars with no strings attached. So they didn't have to give uh, out the loans. They didn't have to get the economy going. They just took it and gambled more with it. I'm telling you, if Geithner doesn't realize the game that's being played, he's the biggest fool of all. I bet there's a memo somewhere at Goldman saying, hey, the best way to make money is Geithner arbitrage. Okay, he's the real inefficiency in the market. Let's take advantage. So, as I said, Paul Abrams wrote about this today, and he said, uh, now, if they give out all this money, hundreds of billions of dollars, and th that's through TARP, but then there's the Fed, actually, the Fed window, which is a different issue, uh, gi giving them uh, loans at near 0%, they could turn around and give it to the Treasury at near 4%. So the banks take money from the government at almost nothing, and then loan it back to the government at 4%. <laughs> I mean, you wonder why I get upset and yell and scream about, you know, how we're getting robbed. I mean, that's, that's highway robbery. They're just taking our money and just loaning it back to us at 4%. It's crazy. Why would we do that? We would do that if our government is fundamentally corrupt or fundamentally foolish. But neither speaks well of it. And all right, now to go back just real quick to that point uh, of Elizabeth Warren's report, uh, that oversight panel saying that the small businesses have not gotten the loans. And as I explained to you, she goes into some detail with some specifics, uh, but they basically sat on the money. It's, uh, you know, I'll go one more detail into explaining that, which is, look, if you give, let's say, let's take an example, well, you just gave $100 billion to Bank of America, right? 
and you said, all right, I'm doing this so that you can go out there and lend money to the small business, get that economy going. Bank of America takes it and goes, oh, thanks a lot. Whew. We're not going to lend out any of it because they didn't make us do it. They didn't, that wasn't part of the conditions. Instead, now that $100 billion is sitting in my bank, I could go turn around and say, all right, I'd like to make a trillion dollars worth of derivatives bets because I now have $100 billion to back it up. <laughs> so then you just greatly endangered the economy instead of doing the opposite. You encouraged crazy risk-taking, and the money didn't actually... Why do you think we have the 10% unemployment? Why do you think the economy is still in the crapper? It's because the money never got to us. It just went straight into the banks. Geithner, the worst of the worst of the worst. All right, so now uh, I'm going to relate that to an article I read, which swings both ways. It's in the New York Times, and it's about uh, people who have been laid off in this tough market who might not get their jobs back. And it's true. You know, we, uh, they tracked this woman who, uh, Cynthia Norton, she was uh, an administrative assistant in Jacksonville. And, you know, she's been doing the right thing, you know, playing by the rules all this time. And uh, she is an excellent secretary and administrative assistant. Been doing it for a long time with many of the top companies, can type 120 words a minute, etc. And she doesn't know why the rug's been pulled out from underneath her. And as the story explains, she's worried, did I put my resume on the wrong kind of paper? No, Cynthia, it's got nothing to do with that. Those jobs are gone. They're never coming back. Okay. Now, because as I was reading the article, I was thinking, who hires secretaries anymore? Sure, I mean, I guess lawyers do, old school people do, uh, some top executives do. But normally, every company used to have an exec secretary. Now they call them administrative assistants, whatever you want to call them, right? Like when you came into Rebel headquarters, you would first see an administrative assistant, and they'd welcome you, and they'd do filing, and then they'd type things out. Think about it for a second. Because I hadn't thought about it. I was like... Who the hell would hire a secretary? Typing? What? I can type. You just send out letters. I send out emails. I mean, this, it's like it's, there. a lot of people, I don't blame them. That's just how they grew up in that economy where you'd say, all right, Sally, can you type out this letter for me? Wow. She typed out that letter quick, 120 words a minute. That's amazing. Who cares? Just send the email. Of course your job is going to get eliminated. Filing? Nobody does like, uh-uh. Let's put some files in there and put it in the cabinet. No, everything's on the computer. So, Cynthia, I love you, but that job is gone, okay? And not all over the country, but dwindling and dwindling. So, now, here's where I would probably diverge from some liberals. And, you know, liberals say, oh, no, we got to protect the jobs. Protect the jobs. Don't lose them. Oh, it's going to Mexico and it's going to India and damn NAFTA and the damn free trade and stuff. I don't want to get caught up in words, free trade, fair trade. You know, it's a lot of semantics in there, right? But the bottom line is, you are going to lose a lot of those jobs for good. And some of them are going to go to India. And there ain't a damn thing we can do about it. We can complain. We can try to be protectionist. It's not going to work, right? But that doesn't mean there isn't anything we can do. So I was thinking, what can we do with, for people like Cynthia? And at the end of the article, I got a little bit better sense of it. She says, well, you know what? Actually, there is a job that's perfect for me, but it's out in L.A., I'm in Jacksonville, and I'm just, I don't have any money left. I s trained up on another field, a medical field, but it turns out you have to do an internship for free for a year before you can get hired. She's like, I can't work for free for a year. And she's at, at wit's end, right? And th then, you know, you feel, at least I feel bad. Maybe you shouldn't feel bad. But she says, it seems like there's a program for everybody. They have minorities have programs. The veterans have programs. The disabled have programs. But who's got a program for me, right? Now, look, you read that and it feels not so great, right? You're like, ah, oh, what programs do minorities have? I might be missing something. And I'm sure there are in some different fields. But generally, there isn't a program for, oh, you're a minority out of work. Well, then, come on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a job. There's no such program, right? But there are programs for veterans and disabled, et cetera. So I can feel her pain, even though it might be misdirected, right? She says, if I just had $3,000, I could then afford to move out to L.A., and then I got a job, I'm back on my feet, right? So then I thought, maybe we could do microloans. We can't change the macro picture. And there are things to get angry about, things not to get angry about. Should we get angry at the banks for taking all the money? Absolutely, because then there's no money left for the rest of us, and they were just doing uh, bets with one another. It's absurd and outrageous. You get angry at a changing economy, 
there, no, there I turn, you know, I don't know if you want to call it conservative, I don't know what you want to call it. But no, an economy changes. We don't have the horse and buggy anymore. We have cars. I, you know, I'm sure there was heart-wrenching stories about the guys who ran the horse and buggies and then at the end, near the end of their lives couldn't do it anymore and were out of work and in terrible shape. But so what can we do? We can do I, my, what I think is microloans, okay? Now, I hesitate in saying that. You just saw me hesitate a little bit because people have this image of, oh, microloans are for the developing world. And they give a little bit here and a little bit there. But you know what? They have tremendous success, especially in giving to women. Now, I don't want to limit it to just women, but in the, that's the area that they've had success with worldwide. They, now, in some countries, you don't need a lot. So it could be as small as a $200 loan, which makes an enormous difference or helps them to set up a business. Here in the U.S., it could be more. But Cynthia only needed $3,000. And I believe her. Now, look, that doesn't mean you give out $3,000 to everybody who wants it. There's a system that you set up to do this. But look, that's where you can funnel the money. Instead of giving all the money to the big banks and then hope that they give it to small businesses, et cetera, no, just take the money, a much, much smaller amount, and you could do what we've learned in developing countries in giving out microloans to Americans to be able to shift fields or sometimes shift location to get back on their feet. We can do that. See, that's the kind of innovative thinking we need, and that's the kind of improvement uh, that we can have in our economy if we think outside the box a little bit. We can't solve all the problems, but we can be smart and solve some of them and get real help to actual Americans that don't work on Wall Street. All right, those are my ideas. Now, uh, I've given you a bunch of good news. I've got to give you uh, a little bit of bad news, right? Now, this isn't, this isn't bad news per se. It's just, you know... I've had a lot of issues with how Obama has backpedaled on a lot of things. Guantanamo detainees, civilian trials, Miranda, long list, right? Um, and I said, look, it, it doesn't really help you uh, because you just look weak when you do it. Well, now we have a perfect example of that. Bill O'Reilly has Dennis Miller on his program, and they are just going to yuck it up about how Obama has been backpedaling and how he's been giving in to Fox News. And they're going to give you a laundry list for you guys. And as you watch this, it's repulsive. And I, I wish Obama would watch this the next time he thinks about folding on an issue and how O'Reilly's going to get on there and go, ha, 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 we got him, yeah, he back to our will. So send this to the White House, okay? Now, one thing i got to clarify before we show you the clip. No, nobody can understand Dennis Miller. He's always got these 100 different references that are going through his head. The Stedman he's referring to here is Attorney General Eric Holder because he thinks he looks like Oprah Winfrey's boyfriend. <laughs> All right, don't get distracted by that. Listen to the main message. Go ahead. Miranda. Now this we uh, covered uh, with Holder, um, yeah. now who was, you know, Mirandizing people before they got on the planes, uh, <laughs> not after the, the bomb. And now he's go, well, you know, no, we need a little room now. We don't really need yeah. it right away. So uh, you know, talk about a flip flop. Well, all of a sudden, Stedman's Jack Bauer, you know, he comes in. <laughs> Stedman. I don't know what they got out of Shazbot. Uh, and by the way, what was that kid when he converted to Islam? Was he watching uh, Mork and Mindy reruns on Nick at Night? But Shazbot must have said something that scared the hell out of those guys. He must have said that Al-Qaeda's prime directive now was to repeal Obamacare because Stedman came in over the weekend, all of a sudden he's Curtis LeMay. They're ready to change Gitmo into Camp David. And you know something, between the unmanned drones now, re-upping the Patriot Act for another year, keeping Gitmo open, following the Bush-Cheney footsteps in Iraq, and reinvigorating the fight in Afghanistan, can waterboarding be far behind, Billy? <laughs> Yippee! I like, I like what That's... I'm seeing. Oh, rubbing in their face! You know what? I kind of like it because you, they're right. You did flip-flop on all that stuff, and they get to laugh at you. Okay, go, ha, ha, what's next? You followed everything Bush and Cheney did. I bet you go to waterboarding next, you punk. That's what, they're, that's what Fox News is telling you, Obama. What are you going to do about it? Look, my guess is you're going to do it again. My guess is you're going to flip-flop again, and it ain't going to help you because O'Reilly's going to come out there with a smug look and go, ha, ha, we got him to flip-flop. And you're not going to get any credit for it. You're going to get disdain for it. But look, it's up to you. How about next time you stand up to them and you don't flip-flop? How about we try that once? Think about it, Young Turks.
You know this. All right, back on the Young Turks. Jay Huger, Master Casper is back. Anna Kasparian is here. She's got a couple of fun stories for you guys, and um, some not so fun, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get slightly enraged about one of them, so that'll be good. All right, uh, what are we starting with? Do you want to start with the Muslims? Sure, why not? Okay, let's do it. Uh, so the Secular Student Alliance uh, in Ohio has decided that they are going to join together and they are going to draw stick figures and label them Muslim on uh, their campuses. And no, no, man. <laughs> label them Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad, I'm sorry. <laughs> Muhammad. You Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so they're going to label these stick figures Muhammad. And, of course, they're doing this because uh, they want to support the freedom of speech without intimidation. Uh, and this all comes after the whole South Park controversy where um, the creators of South Park had a, a cartoon depicting Muhammad and uh, they got death threats from a fringe Muslim group because of it. Right. So now, here's the situation, right? Um, first of all, just a quick note. It turned out it wasn't even Muhammad. Uh, it was a bear dressed as Mo Muhammad dressed as a bear, which actually turned out to be Santa Claus, just to be fair to South Park. Right. Okay. <laughs> Now, <laughs> I love that people got mad about that. I know. They're like, wait a minute, is, was the bear Mohammed or was the bear Santa Claus? Because depending on which, we might come to kill you. I mean, think about how absurd that is, right? So I, I love that this secular group, uh, student group, uh, decided, hey, you know what? We're going to exercise our First Amendment rights. And they were, they're just drawing them in chalk. So yes. it's even, you know, I guess less offensive because it could be easily wiped away. Doing it in three different universities. They are doing it at three different universities. Uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, Champaign, University of Wisconsin at Madison, and Northwestern University. Right. Now, uh, so the Muslim groups in those universities actually got mad, okay? And one of them uh, went around and erased the Mohammed uh, picture as soon as it happened. And th now there's a debate online, uh, including a guy named Ibu Patel, who says, hey, you know what, this is really offensive to Muslims, and this is not the way that you exercise your First Amendment rights. You guys are being jerks, etc. All right, first, you, you go. I, I could not disagree with uh, Mr. Ibu Patel. or Ibu? Mr. Patel. I don't know how to pronounce it. Either. Anymore. Like, I, no way. I 100% disagree with him. Who cares? Are you uh, confident w in your religion? Uh, do you believe in your religion? If you do, who cares what other people have to say about it? Yeah. Your faith is between you and whatever your religion is, okay? What other people say should not matter to you whatsoever. And yes, I do believe it's a First Amendment right to be able to say whatever you want to say about someone else's religion. Uh, of course, I totally agree with that. I'm going to go a little further. Look, um, Muslims, and look, I'm from a Muslim background. My family's Muslim. I was Muslim, etc. So it's not like I, I'm uh, judging this from the outside, okay? They are choosing to get offended by this. It's a total choice. They don't have to get offended at all. It's like they, they're looking for some reason to get offended. Okay, In Islam, it says, you shall not depict Muhammad. It doesn't say JR shouldn't depict Muhammad. It doesn't say Andrew shouldn't depict or Anna shouldn't depict Muhammad. It, that's their business. Not you know. It, it says you shouldn't eat pork. It doesn't say Anna can't eat a pepperoni pizza. I mean, if you want, I guess you get offended. But, and I can't believe you would eat a pepperoni pizza when there are Muslims in the world. Well, what the, go, go eat your own pizza. What, what, why do you care what she's eating? You're not supposed to get drunk, but it doesn't matter if other people get drunk. What, are you going to get offended because they didn't listen to the Quran? You know why they didn't listen to the Quran? Because they're not Muslim, okay? And they don't believe what you believe. They can make stick figures of anybody. They can make a stick figure of Muhammad or Santa Claus, and it's none of your goddamn business, okay? No, it, this is all... Uh, an, Look, for, there's the crazy, and understand there's two different groups here, three different groups. There's the crazy fundamentalists, okay, who are like, oh my God, you have offended me in Allah, and I don't really believe in him, so I, you know, because if I did, I think he'd, you know, torture you forever in hell, but I don't really believe he exists, so I plan to kill you, because I'm, what, stronger than Allah? <laughs> well, you know, what can you do to me that Allah can't, right? So they, they're like, they're the worst. They actually don't believe in their religion at all, if you ask me. Then there's the great majority of Muslims who couldn't care less. Mm -hmm. They're average people going about their days, they're an accountant, they're this, they're that. They're like, oh, you drew a figure of what? I don't care. Go draw whatever the hell you like. Right? Mm -hmm. Not on my business, right? And then now there's this new group in the middle, 
I think that's in some of these universities, the Muslim Student Alliance is that, et cetera. They're not threatening violence or anything like that. I don't want anybody to, get, to mistake what's happening. They just say they're offended and they think that this is insensitive, et cetera, right? And I think that they, those guys, and now I'm going to get a little controversial, they're looking to have fun and to get offended at something. Okay. And, and create controversy, like, oh my God, because I know how it is at college. Look, I, I was, oh my God, I'm so offended by what happened. Somebody drew in chalk, a stick figure. No, You're not you know really what? offended. You're making it up. Well, you don't know that, Jake. Look, no, that, I'm going over the top. You're making it up. Okay, this is. But I know because I read the Quran. Okay, I mean, like I say, you choose to get offended at anything with somebody else. Does they're not Muslim. You are. But you, look, don't draw the picture of Muhammad if you're going to be a good Muslim and butt out of other people's business. It's a choice to be offended, but you have the right to be offended. If you want to be offended, of then go. Of course, like, I'm not banning I know, them. I know, I'm not you're like not. them. I'm not going to walk around being like, I'm going to erase you being offended. No. Don't be offended. Otherwise, I'll be offended that you're offended. Look, the, the as an problem, agnostic, I am deeply offended that anyone would care about religion. Listen, I understand. Deeply offended. I understand uh, why Patel is offended. Okay, mm -hmm. the w one part of his argument that I do not agree with is where he says that uh, offending Muslims is not freedom of speech. Right? I think that offending Muslims should be included as freedom of speech. Okay, but as far as feeling offended, yeah, yeah, I would feel offended too. But get over it. Yeah. Welcome to America. Yeah, exactly. You're going to run into people like this all the time. And look, put this in a different situation, okay? Let's say that this is a black and white issue, right? Mm -hmm. If white people wrote something uh, or used chalk to draw something on the ground mm -hmm. depicting an African-American or a black person, yeah, the African-American community would be offended. And we would say, yeah, they have the right to be offended, okay? Right. But look, I think it's different, and I'll tell you why, okay? Because uh, when they throw stereotypical images of African Americans, in the past, the reason why we get bothered by that, because in the past they would do that, and then they would go and inflict violence upon African Americans. So it's what it stands for, right? Now, do Muslim Americans have real problems in America with discrimination? Absolutely. And I'm the first guy to talk about it. I go on a warpath over stuff like that. If you target Muslims instead of the religion and your disagreements with the religion, I think those are two totally separate things. But I don't think there's been a history in America of drawing stick figures and then going and bashing Muslims. See, that's made up. That never happened. Whereas if somebody was to do something against somebody wearing a turban or you know, said something against Muslims in general, then I'm 100% on your side. Let's go get them. Right? But when there are so many real problems in the country, I mean, after 9-11, Muslims and some non-Muslims who were confused for Muslims got killed by idiot vigilantes who, when they had nothing to do with 9-11, that's a real issue. Somebody drawing a stick figure has no historical context, is not something that is worthy of your getting offended and getting all worked up. You were just looking to have some fun on college and you get riled up and do a protest or something. No, I'm not buying it. I don't care what you say. Under no conditions am I buying it. Go. Okay? All right, let's switch the topic to <laughs> peanut allergies since you're not buying it. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, there was a recent study done that shows that peanut allergy uh, has nearly tripled uh, among young people. Yeah, look, let me tell you something. Uh, here's, it's funny because here's another story that I didn't buy for a long time. Like, everybody's like, oh, you know, get the peanuts away, get the peanuts away! Oh, my kid has peanut allergy, you monster! What are you doing eating a nutty bar near him? <laughs> okay, uh, that didn't actually happen to me. Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is back when I was an idiot conservative. Okay, I was like, yeah, 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 peanut allergy. Where the hell did that come from? That didn't exist before. It's totally psychological. A bunch of libs running around like, oh, I got an allergy. Oh, I'm so sensitive. Right? I also didn't believe in mold. What? <laughs> I was a conservative. I just didn't believe in facts. I was like, yeah, mold. You got sick from mold. You didn't get sick from mold. Just calm down. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> There's a lot of things I didn't believe. But it turns out, when you look at the facts, <laughs> aren't you glad I switched over to being a lip? I'm way oversimplifying my previous positions. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, what, what happened is that, yes, actually, I was right. There wasn't as many peanut allergies before, but it's not because they made it up, okay? It's because we're doing something different that's yeah. causing the peanut allergies and other allergies to significantly increase. Yeah, th that was the most interesting part of this story, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, all the germaphobes out there who keep everything clean, you're going to get sick. You're going to get peanut allergies. Uh -huh. At least that's one of the theories here, okay? First of all, let's... It seems like you're taking a little joy in it. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, what happened now, germaphobe? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, this and this. And, oh, the hand wash. Okay. <laughs> Enjoy your peanut allergy. <laughs> no, but look. You, you have to introduce bacteria into your body. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, it's how you build your immune system, okay? It's I've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> medical study after medical study will prove it to you. If you are constantly worried about germs, if you're constantly clean, the second you're exposed to bacteria or a virus, you are going to get sick immediately. No, and this is one of the leading theories. I mean, it, obviously, we're just reporting that something that was written here in the live science, okay? And uh, so that's part of it, because the body then reacts because it wants to do defense. It's used to doing defense. So uh, then it d defends itself against allergens uh, or proteins in the body uh, because it has nothing else to repel. It's fascinating how the human body works. So that's part of the issue. And so I had read this a little while ago, right? Now this has more details. But when I read that, I was like, oh my God, if I ever have a kid, I'm taking it to the farm and just rolling them around in the dirt. <laughs> okay? I'm serious. I thought that, of course. <laughs> the thing is, I'm goofy enough to do it. Oh okay, God. at least in the in the grass, that's for sure. Yeah, okay, go, go. Get some allergies, huh? huh? Get used to it. Fight that off. <laughs> Take some peanut smash. Okay, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. It might be way too late by the time the kid's born. Okay, and then you do that, and he blows up, and it's some serious stuff. It I mean, is. it's possibly lethal. And uh, and then I thought there was one other reason um, that they uh, think that the allergies are going up. Go. Uh, the, other, <laughs> the other reason had something to do with like eggs, and if you're allergic to eggs when you're born, then you're probably going to get. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for clear? Live science. <laughs> no, I, I, so it's my bad. I was I had it at the tip of my tongue and I forgot it. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's some other reason. Look out for it. Okay, <laughs> just don't do that. No, scientists have another way of predicting peanut allergies. Like uh -huh. if you are born and you have an allergy to uh, milk and eggs. Uh -huh. you are likely to have an allergy to peanuts in the future, developing an allergy to, to peanuts in the future. Oh, okay. Oh, I remember what it was. Mm -hmm. The other possibility is that it's what we eat, right, and it's the environment we're in. So it might be the hormones that are affecting the kid in utero, mm -hmm. et cetera. And so that's why things change, because the hormones we're putting in our bodies have changed. So it's a combination of those two factors. So uh, that's why we're getting more and more of these allergies. It's scary stuff, you know. Because I know, I, and I have, and that's part of what changed my mind. Evidence. Uh, uh, by the way, another tidbit of evidence we didn't, we haven't mentioned yet: three million Americans today, Americans have peanut allergies. Americans, not even like Norwegians <laughs> or Hutus. <laughs> Americans have this allergy. So imagine how strong it is <laughs> if it affects us Americans. Okay, no, he, the evidence I was going to say is one of my friends has a daughter that if you anywhere near a peanut, like serious, like life-threatening emergency. They have to carry around a shot with them. Oh, my God. Okay, it's really scary stuff. So you see that, and you're like, oh, okay. That's not psychological in a six-month-old. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was a moron. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know what? Jank Uger, along with Bradley Byrne, a goddamn liberal, was his evidence. So it's a good thing I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm in that camp now. All right, what's next? All right, the Gay and Lesbian uh, Alliance Against Defamation is asking Newsweek for an apology. Actually, they're demanding Newsweek apologize uh, for a review that they wrote on Promises, Promises, starring Sean Hayes. Mm -hmm. uh, Ra Ramin Setude wrote that uh, critique, and he says that uh, Sean Hayes is too gay to play a straight role. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why Glad's pissed. I can't <laughs> quite figure it out. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was, it was horrible. And... It's uh, and it turns out Raman is is gay himself, right? Yes, yes. But it doesn't really excuse writing a, a stereotypical piece like that, and it's also blindingly inaccurate. There's so many actors in Hollywood who were who are gay, and who in the past there have been gay actors as well, like Rock Hudson, and we didn't know they were gay at all. Obviously, did did Rock Hudson pull off being straight for uh, several decades? Come on. And Raman's point was like. It seems like Sean Hayes is hiding something. That's because he is. And, yeah, but all actors hide things. And Glad right. then comes around and says, hey, listen, uh, are actors who are not married to one another hiding something? Do they actually have a hidden spouse at home? It's like, of course, they're actors. So, 
Uh, this I understand why they got offended. Yeah, I don't. I don't understand why uh, a gay writer for Newsweek would throw his own community under the bus. It doesn't make any sense. My guess is that by this point, he's really regretting it. Of course he is. <laughs> Look, yesterday I was at um, the late George Carlin's seventy-third birthday celebration. Okay? Uh, that sounds pretty cool. So there were a bunch of comedians there, and there was one gay comedian. I think his name was Jason Lewis. I'm not one hundred percent sure. But we were talking about this uh, situation. He brought it up immediately. He's like, oh, what do you think of Newsweek? You go, I told him we do a political show, and it's the first issue he brought up. And uh -huh. I was like, oh, it's terrible. It's horrible. And he went on and on at how upset he was at this critique. And, um, yeah, I agree with him. It is terrible. Uh, now, here's the thing. It, this also is, it's not just, oh, we're offended because he wrote something we don't like. Look, this is what keeps people in the closet because it, People will then say, oh, I know he's gay, so I, I won't buy him playing straight. And you have to understand what knuckleheads the executives in Hollywood are. Once that gets out there, they'll, they will discriminate like you have no idea. They'll be like, oh, no, Sean Hayes is gay, and now, oh, no, nobody will buy that he's straight. And boom, all his roles go away. And so, and that's the great irony. You know, they call Hollywood liberal, liberal, liberal. It's actually... Um, shockingly discriminatory in in so many different ways and they have these certain stereotypes in their head and so it can cost a lot of gay actors jobs and it can cause a lot of gay actors to stay in the closet so that's why it doesn't make any sense and will uh, they eventually apologize for this of course of course they will it's I don't know why they haven't done it yet it's crazy all right uh, I have one last story for you guys uh, Michelle Bachman has compared uh, financial reform to Mussolini-style fascism. So you see, this is the kind of stuff I love, when they take stuff and turn it on its head, right? So, uh, now, in fascism, you had the private companies basically running the government, okay? Which actually is frightening cl close to what we have now, right? Mm -hmm. So what, we're, what financial reform is trying to do is regulate those companies so they're no longer running the government, okay? Right. And that there's a check on them, there's a cop to make sure that they're playing fair and by the rules. So Michelle Bachman takes that and says, let's remember really what this is. This has a lot in common with Italy in the 1930s and the way Italy dealt with economics. It still continues private ownership of business, but government is in control. No, that's the exact opposite of what's happening. In Mussolini's Italy, they weren't like, hey, you know what, private corporations are out of hand. Let's really regulate, crack down on them and, and get tough on them. No, they did the exact opposite. But that's the great advantage of being conservative. You can be fact-free, and your followers will never find out. They'll be like, oh, yeah, totally, man. If the government tries to protect us from the private corporations, we'll be like the fascists. Yeah, I don't want to be like Mussolini. Goddamn Obama. Liberal. Him and Bradley Byrne. And Jank Uger. And peanut allergies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Young Turks. All right, back on the Young Turks. Uh, I've decided that uh, I'm going to kick over some of my Eastern European theories uh, to the post game. Because during the break, we, I came up with more good theories about why Eastern Europe is so miserable. Mm -hmm. Okay, it involves the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about it, okay? We'll come back to that in the post game. All right, let's start with our high end escort in Scottsdale, Arizona. Her mm -hmm. name is Jennifer Thomas. Uh, she's 26 years old, and she was partying at the Valley Ho in Scottsdale, Arizona. That's already awesome. <laughs> and, um, you know, she had a nice night of drinking and partying, and she was ready to call it a night, so she goes outside and she talks to the valet. She asks the valet to get her a ride, call her a cab. So he does exactly that. He gets a nice yellow cab for her. Okay. okay. It seems good. Okay. As soon as she saw the cab, this is what she said. I'm not effing getting into that. Well, she said fucking. <laughs> oh, she did. Okay. All right. <laughs> Could you imagine? She's all worked up. She's like, I'm not effing doing anything. All right. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to say, I'm not fucking getting into that. Who do you think I am? And then she con continues to say, you should know I need a sedan. Please. You're a whore. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, whatever. Well, how do you get that sense of entitlement? Okay, it's amazing. How do you get that sense of entitlement? I, 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 I think I honestly believe that I could be a millionaire and I could never treat anyone that way. And what's wrong with a yellow cap? <laughs> I, I literally don't know. I mean, like if somebody got me a yellow cap, I'm like, thanks a lot, buddy. I appreciate it. <laughs> like I wouldn't be like, who do you think I am? <laughs> that I would take transportation. 
Okay, I mean, what do you do you want? You want a hollow deck? What do you What do you need? Do you want me to transport you and beam you over to the other place? So apparently, she wanted a sedan, uh, and I mean, it's enormously ironic that she's a prostitute. Uh, and it's, but you know what? Also, probably cause she's insecure, so she thinks in her crazy mind, this son of a bitch called me a yellow cab because he knows I'm a whore, right? And I suspect that's what happened here. So then... I don't think that's what happened. She's one of those high-end prostitutes. So mm. she probably thinks, like, oh, I'm making the big bucks, so I deserve the Crown Victoria. And that's what he did. Afterwards, he called for a Crown Victoria, right? She, and before she gets in the car, she takes her high heel off, her stiletto off her foot, and she starts banging it against his head. So now she's been uh, charged with um, assault. Okay, no, no, you don't understand. Like, you, like at first, I was like... Oh, yeah, she's trying to beat him with his slipper, with her slipper, whatever, okay, go, go away, right? No, the heel stuck in his head, and then when she took it out, it started gushing blood. They, he said, they said he lost a tremendous amount of blood, he was disoriented, et cetera. I mean, she did some serious damage with that hoe heel. No, this story makes me so angry. I don't know, I, when I read this, I was outraged, okay? A, because of the sense of entitlement, and B, because of the way she treated this poor valet guy. You know me, I don't like valet guys. I can't stand them. But you don't treat an individual like that. <laughs> What's wrong with valet guys? I, wh because where did that always, random hate come from? Because they're always manhandling your car, and they're always like nicks and dents in it after they're through with really? it. Really? No, my sense of valet guys is they're always parking your car. No. <laughs> I think, why, thank you. No, no, no. The, the, look, I feel bad because I always take my aggression out at the middleman uh -huh. in this case. You know I hate paying for parking. You know I hate oh, paying for Oh, that's to, what yeah. it is. So the valet okay. guy, he's the face. He's the person he's I the see. He's the face of evil parking. <laughs> so you, you're lucky she didn't go after you with this stiletto. But no, think about that, too. You're right about the entitlement because mm -hmm. here's this prostitute who thinks she's so above everybody else. That How dare this lowly valet guy who's actually trying to earn a living doing something decent and respectable, right? This lowly valet guy who doesn't make as much money as she does prostituting her body, mm -hmm. okay? Get her the wrong kind of vehicle, so he should be smashed in the head with her heel, right? Uh, but we're ignoring the best part of this story. She was at the Valley Ho Hotel. Are you shitting me? <laughs> okay, where were you? I was at the Ho Hotel. Okay, I mean, it's not just the Ho Hotel. It's the Valley Ho Hotel. I mean, <laughs> that place must be filled to the rim with prostitutes. <laughs> like, well, where did you go? Well, where the hell do you think I went? Of course I went to the Valley Ho Hotel. <laughs> Who do you think I am? <laughs> All right, come on, that's a great story. Yeah, you know what? And I also, I feel bad because I, I feel like I'm putting her down because she's an escort, whatever. But it doesn't have to do with the fact that she's an escort. It's honestly 100% because of the sense of entitlement she has, because of the amount oh, of, of course money. Of it is not. Yeah, like, because of the oh, money she's Oh, but made. you're also a little pissed at that. That's true. Of course I am. Okay, there's How a couple I... of different angles here. Okay. There are, there are. Well, I'm upset because she took a chunk out of the guy's head, right? And the poor guy did everything right, and, and you know he's trying to earn a living. You're upset because there's parking involved. <laughs> no, okay. uh, hold on. I'm upset at the assault as well. Okay, do not. <laughs> no, no, no. I know. I'm mm -hmm. kidding. Uh, no, you're upset that that prostitute is making that much money. Yeah, that too. Of course. God, it is an unjust world. It really is. I mean, look, because I think of that 52-year-old that we talked about in the second hour, Cynthia Horton. You know, and she's secretary all her life. She's so proud. She can type 120 uh, minutes, uh, words a minute. She's like, I can type this. Why can't, won't anybody hire me? Watch. <laughs> right? But she's been working hard her whole life, right? Yeah. And I know she's got some things, that you, thoughts that she, sh you know, that we're not comfortable with and stuff. But it's, you know, it also depends on the context you grew up in, et cetera. While she's busting her ass, this valley hoe is going around taking chunks out of dudes' heads because they got her a yellow cab because she's so high and mighty because she makes more money being a prostitute. Mm -hmm. So that's the anger, and I, and I feel that anger. I feel your pain at it. Yeah. And Cynthia feels your pain. Uh-oh, here comes Jair. He's Come trying on, to hold Jair. it back. He's trying to hold it back. Don't do it. Let it go. <laughs> um, I, I'm glad you guys brought it up because I wasn't going to. I just want to make sure that as long as this wasn't some CEO or executive or a businesswoman with makes a lot of money walking out and then getting upset because she's getting a subpar car. I just want to make sure I'm not saying this whole thing she can get something besides a piece of shit 
dusty ass car that's no, going to give her a dis- no, that didn't even occur to me look even if it were a ceo okay that sense of entitlement is inexcusable that's not okay <laughs> Okay, you're not the president of the United States. You don't treat other people that way. I think a CEO is worse, of course, yeah. to, to do that. But I, that the thought never even occurred to me. I mean, look, I, you know, and sometimes I say it in a way, I'm glad you uh, clarified that, and some people get mad at me with it. You know, we use the word ho or whatever. And, you know, come on, the hotel was called Valley Ho. And, and I'm, but I'm a bad guy. I use whore sometimes, too. It's an ugly word. Look, they're trying to earn a living, too. I mean, this one happened to be crazy. But everybody's trying to earn a living. Of course. And, and I think it should be legal, so... Don't get me wrong. Okay. Russell Brand, let's do it. Uh-oh. He had an interview with Playboy. Playboy has really good interviews, by the way. Oh, First John I only Mayer. read it for the articles. <laughs> First John Mayer and now uh, Russell Brand. But anyway, so they're speaking to Russell Brand, and uh, he talks about his uh, promiscuous past. I'm going to read you his quote. He says, when I was at my most promiscuous, I was like a charging locomotive. My selection process was outsourced. I had a team of experts who took care of finding women for me. They had very specific instructions. If I was, uh, it was as if I was uh, talking to a wine steward. I'm looking for something French, a bit fruity, smells of oak. Uh, fruity, that's the, <laughs> that picture right there, smells of oak. I mean, that's, <laughs> all right, but look, uh, he had the life, man. He was living the dream. Mm -hmm. that, I don't know if he knows, this, that's what all guys dream about. Okay. In fact, I didn't even dare to dream that. Like, we, we dream that, hey, you know what, we can get so big that women throw themselves at us, and we'd be like, oh, I'll take a little French there, and I'll take a little Persian here, and, you know, oh, look at that, Taiwanese. Hmm. Okay. So, but he, I, I couldn't even, I didn't realize you could have a posse do that for you. Mm -hmm. Like, how rich and famous are you? I didn't realize Russell Brand was that big. I knew he was big. But Jesus, right? Can you imagine? And you're like, okay, you know what? Tonight I'd like to dine on um, South Indian. Please, uh, go away. Go get me a South Indian and bring her back. And they bring her, him a sexy South Indian. And he's like, how do you do? And goes to work. You know, he gave up that lifestyle to be with Katy Perry. He's engaged to her now. Disaster. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Yeah. I uh, don't think it's a disaster. I think Katy Perry is hot. No, and, no, no, nothing wrong with Katy Perry. And Katie she Barry. skateboards. She, yeah, she skateboards. She's unbelievable. Uh, now, he says he's a reformed sex addict. Why? Why? Why did you get reformed? Are you crazy? Now, look, of course, I didn't leave that, le lead that life, so it's easy for me to say that. Well, of course, what happens when you lead that life is uh, you get bored. That I mean, so, you know, rich guys, they don't know how valuable their money is because they've had it for so long that they're, they're bored with their money, right? And Russell Brand's been having, you know, Badge thrown at him for so long that he's bored by it. He's like, oh, you know, I had this and I had that. I had, you know, my man Jeeves go r rustle up some uh, kind of uh, different poon for me. Okay, <laughs> until I got bored of the poon. I was swimming in an ocean of it. And it makes me want to strangle him. <laughs> okay. No. And, and I like the guy. I mean, he's a good comedian and all that mm -hmm. stuff. But, uh, dude, you weren't a, se I mean, look, who knows who's a sex addict, right? But you, you were doing what every guy would have done if, you, if they could. Now, if he says, look, I did that, and I'm done with it, it was good enough, and now I want to get married, well, of course, have at it, Hoss, God bless. It's just I'm a little mad that uh, I'm never, ever going to get that. Yeah, I'm bitter about prostitutes making more money than me, and you're bitter about uh, <laughs> Russell Brand giving up the poon to be with <laughs> Katy Perry. I mean, you, you don't know how good you had it, man. You don't know. The rest of us never had it that good. And uh, he said, when they asked him about sex addicts, he's like, you know, it's a little over glorified. This made me like it more. Although he's, I think he's being a little unfair, but he's like, sex addicts, you know what they are generally? Perverts and pedophiles. That's what they are. <laughs> <laughs> I love when he said that. <laughs> right. Um, now, he puts himself in that category, too, because he was a sex addict. So, nice self deprecating humor. But uh, Another quote from him it says, uh, it's, just it's just sleazy men pleasuring themselves in dark corners. It kind of made me think of you. <laughs> Well, how did I wind up under the bus? What happened there? Why? Boardwalk blower. Come on. Oh, uh, no, but that's, he said pleasuring themselves. I got pleasure. That's totally different. And we were on top of the boardwalk, not under the boardwalk. <laughs> okay. Okay? Come on, what are you talking about? I don't know if that's much better, but okay. Sex, that put me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, yes, that, okay. <laughs> I'm depressed about that story. I'm going to go tell all my friends about that story. Mm. Right. And then me and Steve O, while we're playing basketball, we're like, ah, we could have, except we couldn't have. <laughs>
but uh, imagine if you could. <laughs> we're both perfectly happily married. We're very happy with our lives. We, we, you know, we'd fit right in in Iceland or Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but still, you're like, oh! Okay, maybe it's normal male nature, maybe it's just us. All right, let's move forward. All right, uh, we've talked about privacy issues with Facebook. Now it turns out that Amazon is facing similar privacy issues. Uh, people are very concerned about a new feature that their Kindle offers that's known as um, Highlight, uh, popular highlights. So what happens with these eBooks is you uh, read whatever book you're reading, and uh, this new Amazon feature allows you to highlight and take notes of passages that you enjoy and you want to refer back to, okay? Uh, but when you do that, it turns out that they send that information to an Amazon server, and then they use that information for a feature known as popular highlights. People can see what the most popular highlight is, what passages people tend to like more. Mm -hmm. Now, that's useful, and people like that, and they like reading the different passages. Um, and they're not theoretically traced back to a, a, an individual who's actually doing the highlighting, so you do, they don't know that Anna highlighted that portion, right? Uh, but here are a number of problems with it. Uh, number one, it, even if Amazon doesn't do it, just putting that information out there can lead other people to finding out what you highlighted. Because mm -hmm. they can say, oh, okay, look, Anna bought Outliers, and then she's in this area, and in this area someone highlighted Outliers. I'm oversimplifying, but people have done this in the past. Mm -hmm. So then they know what you highlighted. So what, what's the big deal, right? Well, it, people are saying that lawyers might go back and do some forensic you know, retracing of people's steps here that they could find out through this public information. And then uh, if a husband highlighted uh, sexual passages in a book, for example, mm -hmm. they might use that in a divorce case. Now, that sounds absurd, but it can happen, and I'm sure it will happen, right? So now that's one of a hundred different things, a thousand different things on how this can get misused. And that story scared me because, you know what, <laughs> nothing's really private online. Right? No, it isn't. And we all know that, but we all play with fire, right? Because I write stuff in emails that I wouldn't want public. No way, I'm just writing it among my friends. And we say, because we're kidding around with each other. They don't even, like if you read those quotes out of context, you don't even know, you know, uh, who I'm writing to. Right? So, for example, with Steve, I might make a Chinaman joke, right? Mm -hmm. Even though he's Korean. See, it's a joke, we're friends, blah, blah, blah. But if you read that, Jank Uger hates Chinaman. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, it's, you see, I mean, I'm giving you a bland example, I think. Um, but, I mean, so, but what do you do? I mean, you can't live in perpetual fear. What are you going to do? Not write emails? I don't know. Look, I love the idea of these ebooks and stuff. But if you're someone who wants to, you know, take notes and highlight things, just have a tangible book with you, okay? Mm -hmm. And do all your highlighting and note taking there. If you feel uncomfortable with this, uh, if you feel uncomfortable with the possibility that someone can trace, back and find out what passages you highlighted, then don't use these ebooks. Don't use the Kindle. I know, but that's what I'm saying. Like, it's easy not to use a Kindle, like we think, because we're not hooked on it. But it's, it's true for Facebook. We did that story. Right. It's true for everything. Well, with Facebook, look, you just have to be careful with what information you put out there. Like, I have a Facebook, right? And look, there was all this controversy because I w would add anyone who wanted to add me because I'm like, oh, they're TYT fans. It's cool. But no, it's not cool. Oh, really? Yeah, Why? I, what happened? Because people will use your personal information to harass you, which is what happened with me. And I decided, look, my Facebook page needs to be simplified. I need to have only... Oh, did you close it out? I didn't close it out. Uh, I still have a Facebook page, but I only add people that I know personally. So uh -huh. I have, you know, my 200 friends that I actually know in person, and that's it. And even the information I have on my Facebook page at this point is very simplistic. Right. No, I, it's tough, man. And it's true, like, like douchebag guys, uh, to draw an analogy here will ruin it for all other guys because they'll go and they'll harangue some girls or whatever mm -hmm. so all girls will get jittery like oh here comes a guy who knows if he's a douchebag or not right when in fact a perfectly lovely guy might be approaching mm -hmm. okay and that's the thing a couple of guys online can ruin it for everybody because they come in or a couple of girls or whatever and they do weird douchebag moves and they go well all right then I gotta shut it down mm -hmm. right so it's tough man it's it's a whole new world out there uh, and it's definitely got some pitfalls, no question about it. All right, we've got to take a break here. Um, I, we also still have one of my favorite stories. It's this one. Yes. The makeup story. Oh. Mm. I mm. think I might join the bandwagon, so get ready for that. Uh-oh. Okay, let's do that when we come back. <laughs>